Sky. Hello and welcome to Red Mother Monster. I'm your host, Lara Ehrlich, and our guest today is Tanana Reeve Du. Before I introduce Tanana Reeve, thank you all for tuning in and please chat with us during the interview. If you enjoy the episode, please also become a patron or patroness to help me keep the podcast going. Now I'm excited to introduce Tanana Reeve. Tanana Reeve Du is an award winning author who teaches Black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA and is an executive producer on Shudder's groundbreaking documentary, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. She and her husband slash collaborator, Stephen Barnes, wrote A Small Town for season two of The Twilight Zone on CBS All Access. As a leading voice in black speculative fiction for more than 20 years, Tanana Reeve has won an American Book Award, an NAACP Image Award, and a British Fantasy Award, and her writing has been included in Best of the Year anthologies. Her books include Ghost Summer Stories, My Soul to Keep, and The Good House. She and her late mother, civil rights activist Patricia Stevens Dew, co-authored Freedom in the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. She has a 17-year-old son and a 35-year-old stepdaughter and describes writer mother writer motherhood in three words as every single day. Now, welcome to Nana Reef. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me. This is exciting. My pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, so from your bio, we have a lot to talk about, but I'm gonna start with the three words you selected to describe writer motherhood. Tell me about every single day. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Uh, people say parenthood changes everything, but people who are not parents often don't really have the vocabulary to understand what that means. Uh, and it's just little things. Uh, the school system, school year, for example, means that once your child hits the public school system from that point until the foreseeable future, you're going to have to get up super, super early every day, no matter what your job is, <laughs> to get your kids to school. You know, we're just basically hanging on till summer. Uh, my husband and I are, are both feeling a little rest broken. Uh, we work at home and always have. So given our own schedule, we probably would be getting up closer to, say, 8.30 in the morning. Uh, but instead, anyway, it goes on and on. That's just one small thing. Uh, there's the, the actual hands-on caretaking aspect of parenthood. And there's the emotional aspect of parenthood. And the caretaking part, you can kind of extrapolate what that looks like preparing and fixing meals, buying clothes, tending to injuries, tending to illnesses and all these kinds of things. But the emotional part, you know, like I'll give you an example. My son is 17, he's six foot five and weighs 220 or so pounds. So he's a big, big kid, but inside he's still kind of a little kid. You know, he likes to, to play childish games and, and that kind of stuff. So the way I see him, is very different from the way he's perceived by the outside world. So one of the things that our family was able to take advantage of during 2020 and the pandemic was we were spending so much time together. It was just the three of us. I think we got a lot closer. We did more activities together. And I had forgotten what it feels like when my son leaves the house. So at one point, I'll call it, you know, three or four months ago, he and his friends got masked up and wanted to go play basketball. That doesn't sound like a big deal. But we live in a mostly white community. I, I, I think it's still mostly white. It's somewhat mixed, but, but three teenage black boys are still a standout in this community, especially at that size. And I had forgotten all through 2020 for all my hypochondria, for all my fear that there would be food shortages, for all my worries with the virtual schooling. I had forgotten what it feels like the minute my son leaves the house. That anxiety, that old anxiety comes in that fear that they're a police magnet, that my son would say or do the wrong thing 
and that on site to a lot of police officers from the training, from TV and media, on site, my son looks like a suspect for something, you know, and a lot of police and the whole idea of profiling is that if you pull over someone black, they're bound to have done something, right? That's the whole, that's really the whole premise of it is the assumption that there's some kind of guilt. So let me just go ahead and find out what it is, <laughs> you know? And uh, that's something that, you know, a 16, 17 year old kid, well, nobody really should be dealing with, but especially a teenager, you know, um, would he, uh, you give him the talk and you, and you try to explain that you want to be respectful without, you, you don't want to be rude and all that kind of stuff, but also you don't want him to be too scared so it's a very difficult balancing act for both his anxieties and my anxieties. And my late mother told me that the anxiety only begins when they leave the house, like not just going out for the night, but when they leave, like they're ready, they're 18, they're 21, they leave the house. That's when it really starts. Yeah, I am not looking forward to that. My daughter is five. <laughs> of course, it's a different situation. She's How old are your kids? I have one daughter and she's five. Oh, yeah. okay. You're yeah. just getting started out. Five is I a great am. age. Five is fun. Yeah. Yeah, five definitely. Um, she's a great age. I don't have the same concerns though about, um, about race. And we should mention that this week was the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And, um, you know, yeah. so that's been, of course, it's always on on people's minds, but this week especially. Um, so tell me a little bit more just about that fear and about the talk that you have with your son. And when did you have the talk for the first time? Um, that's kind of a heartbreaking question because, you know, I think for me, if I look at my childhood, my mom probably had to have the talk with me when I was a little bit younger than your daughter because she was trying to enroll me in Montessori school in Miami, Florida. And this was post the Civil Rights Act. I'm not that old, you know, that it was still the Jim Crow South, but Jim Crow didn't die very quickly. And these were private schools and they had their own rules. So as a four-year-old, she wanted me to enroll me early so I could get a head start in kindergarten. So as a four-year-old, I was subjected to hearing again and again and again that I was being rejected because of my skin color. I have figured this out. I had been to meeting, I had somehow figured this out. So I don't remember that. But what I do remember is rubbing, uh, what do you call it, talcum powder all over my body, like my face, my neck, covering myself with talcum powder and saying to my mom, mom, can I go to school now? So that's when my mom had to have the talk with me. And my heart kind of breaks with her for her when I imagine being in her place, because how do you explain that to a four-year-old? Skin color yeah. is it's a, it's an accident of birth. Even people in the same family have different complexions. It's just meaningless, except that it means so much. So with my son, um, I don't have the vivid memory of the first talk. <laughs> uh, it's it's. But I did when he was about nine. Uh, we, my husband Stephen Barnes and I, took him with us to Mariana, Florida, where uh, we'd been called uh, because. There's a school in Mariana, well, there had been a reformatory in Mariana, Florida called the Dozier School for Boys that operated between about 1900 and about 2000 or so, let's just say. And um, my great uncle was buried there at the age of 15. Many, so many children died at this reformatory that it had its own cemetery. And the Florida State Attorney General's office had called to get permission to start exhuming some, you know, from the families. So my husband, my son, my father, my father and I all went and took part in this beginning of excavation. So he began to actually dig into the soil. And I really think even though it wasn't only black children who died there, it was disproportionately black children who died there. And I think that really sank in. He had a very sober look on his face. Uh, the whole time he was there as he sort of absorbed this idea that the, the children would have been killed. And frankly, by adults, there was a lot of mystery around how a lot of these kids died. And I've heard all kinds of stories. Uh, one who was put inside of an industrial dryer and never seen again. So this was this place was like a horror novel. In fact, I did write a horror <laughs> novel out of it uh, called The Reformatory, which will come out next year. We can talk about that later. But being on those grounds and actually seeing that and being up close to that racial history, I think, made a great impact on him. 
And then I, then it's more when he gets older, he wants to go to the park, right? Like 10, 11, 12 by himself. Like we used to sit and watch him at the park very late, you know, compared to some other kids because he even noticed one time when he was about, I'll call it 12. Uh, oh, we had let him be there a while by himself. We came to pick him up and he and a friend came to the window and his friend was white and they both looked so upset because they said, he said, mom, there was a black teenager just playing basketball by himself. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't even talking any to anybody. And then the police came up to him and they put him in handcuffs and they were, he was so shaken by having witnessed that that is profiling. Okay. And I actually wrote a letter to the local police chief. I happen to have heard about her. She was a uh, Latina. She had come in. I said, let me introduce myself and say hello and also bring up this incident. And to her credit, she called me at like 730 in the morning. Like the minute she got my letter, she called me. She looked up the case and it boiled down to a neighbor thought he looked suspicious. So they called police and she kind of said, see something, say something. And I actually wrote a short story called See Something, Say Something, which is about this incident from the point of view of a white ally who's witnessing this to sort of show people how you can intervene in situations like this uh, before they escalate. Although it's dangerous. I'm not even saying I advise it, but it's a thing that can do. you can do as an observer. When you see black teenagers being harassed, I like to slow my car. I like to let people know they're being watched and they don't like it. They don't like it. You, you can actually be violently confronted for starting to tape a police encounter. So again, I'm not, I'm like, exercise it with caution. But situations like that, um, yeah, that's the that's what leads to the talk. And, and I probably have been giving him some version of that most of his life, but definitely about the time he wanted more independence to walk around, just like walking down Main Street. We live in a kind of a smallish town that has a Main Street. Walking down Main Street, but uh, I can't tell you how many times he's come home and he, telling a story about a police encounter, uh, at least three times, you know? Um, and he notices how quickly they, they reach for the gun, all right? Because they are scared of our kids. And one of the things I said to this police chief in my letter was, you know, studies have shown that children of color, especially black children, often look older than they are to people who are not black. And this is part of what, although it doesn't really matter, they will still shoot a child. Sometimes they don't care, to be honest. But uh, at least you might get a little more grace if a police officer got that you were a minor. But that's long ago now because my son is, is 17, almost an adult. He would be tried as an adult if he were arrested in a lot of jurisdictions. And, and the fact that he's never been arrested before, never gotten into legal trouble before, it doesn't always matter. The judge does not see a human child. They see other in our yeah. system. And I don't mean every judge, but systemically, look at the statistics. The judges see other. Yeah. Yeah. The police, the judges. The police, many, the judges, many, the prosecutors, the list goes on and on and on. And it's frankly horrifying, um, mm -hmm. especially for someone like me who has a very vivid imagination. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. And I want to get to your imagination too. And you've already referenced a few wonderful stories I want to talk to you about. But since we're on this subject, um, tell me a little bit about the book you wrote with your mother and maybe start by telling us about your mother and then about uh, what it was like writing that memoir with her. Well, I like to joke that having collaborated with my late mother and my husband, I can collaborate with anybody because those are such such tight relationships that they can be fraught with conflict and it's difficult. You know, writing is difficult enough by yourself and collaborating adds a level of difficulty. So my mother, I'll tell the audience a little bit about her. Her name was Patricia Stevens Dew. She died in 2012, but she was like one of the first superheroes in my life. She uh, was a civil rights activist who started out as a normal college student, not really giving much thought to any kind of activism her first two years. But then in 1959, she came in contact with an organization called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And CORE had like tactics, like here's a handbook, here's a, here's a workshop, here's how you sit at a lunch counter, you don't look left or right, you don't respond if someone grabs you, 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 know, you go limp, like all these like very concrete tactics to try to bring attention to segregation and try to end segregation. So she and her sister, my aunt who's still living, my aunt Priscilla Krauss, they started a little chapter of CORE at their college at Florida A&M University. And after the Greensboro sit-ins, 
1960, they said it's on and they did sit-ins. And as a result of that, my mother was arrested. She and my aunt spent 49 days in jail. They were sentenced to 60, but got a few days off for good behavior for sitting at a lunch counter in Tallahassee, Florida. They got arrested for that. And as a result of that, she got uh, diaries from Jackie Robinson, the famed baseball player. He, she smuggled a letter out and Jackie Robinson published it in his column in the New York Post, which used to be a thing. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt hosted a party for the students in her home, Harry Belafonte. I mean, the whole civil rights set from the 1960s my mother was in, interacting with. And it was considered the first jail in because they refused to pay their fine uh, to get out of jail, these students. So it was my mother and the, and, um, and other students from Florida and m University. I want to shout out FAMU who did this and kind of made history. And she would show up in my history books, you know, and that wasn't all she did, but that's probably the most famous thing she did. So my whole life, as you can imagine, if you have a mother who's been through something, I'm hearing these stories, you know, many, many times. And I knew she wanted to write a book. And I, in the 90s, I was just starting to get enough fame as, well, famous for a writer, I guess, that we could get a book contract. It wasn't easy. Uh, we tried to sell it as a book of oral histories, just interviewing the people she knew, black and white, who were the ones who stood up when, when the vast majority of people, trust me, were afraid to. Every moment, every movement starts with three or four people or two people, you know, sometimes one person who are like a snowball rolling down a mountain and inspire other people to join them. But it's not like, like, look at all the injustice in the world today. Exactly. So <laughs> in the movement, it started small. So why were you white banker, you know, in Tallahassee? Why did you sneak to the back door to hand them a sack of cash to get students out of jail? Why did you black housekeeper stop on your way to work to sit in with this group of students and then lose your job as a result of that, you know, because she never knew some of these people. She just knew most people were too afraid to do anything, but a handful, like she always said, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And these were the foot soldiers. These were her words. So we, she always wanted to write a book. I finally got famous enough to get a contract. Um, and it was, you know, it was challenging to collaborate. But the thing about collaboration is one person has to have the kill switch. And in this case, my mom had the kill switch. It's her story. You know, one editor said, why don't you write it as a novel? And I got so excited for like five seconds because I know how to do that. I know how to write a novel. I was not a nonfiction writer, even though I'd been a journalist. I'd never written a nonfiction book. So the idea of writing a novel was way more fun, you know what I mean, than, than writing like a history book. <laughs> But it's, it's told in first person and it's alternating chapters, not because I really did much of anything, but because that's how my agent packaged it. He took our little book of oral histories we could not literally give away and repackaged it as a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. So we could basically fold in all those stories and my mother's chapters. And then my chapters were more contemporary, like the anti-apartheid protests I walked out on in college because I had a dinner date. Um, and my mom said, I went to jail so you wouldn't have to. <laughs> and believe me, I have been living by that my whole life. I do not ever intend to go to jail if I can help it. <laughs> That's amazing. She sounds incredible. She really incredible. was. She, she was so strong and she wore dark glasses uh, the whole time I knew her, her whole adult life. Because in 1960, a police officer threw a tear gas canister in her face because oh. he recognized her as a leader of the student movement. And she had sensitivity to light the whole rest of her life. Her, her sunglasses are now on display at the Florida Archives in Tallahassee. Wow. And she's so, in the Civil Rights Hall of Fame of Florida and my dad too. And I'll stop talking. <laughs> no, oh my gosh. No, please don't stop talking. <laughs> um, yeah, so with the example of this, as you called her superhero for a mother, what expectations did that set up for you of motherhood? And then we can talk about writing motherhood. Let's just start with motherhood and what kind of mother you you wanted to be based on her the example. Yeah, the expectations were super high, I have to yeah. tell you. Uh, she was someone who basically, for all intents and purposes, gave up a lot of her activism, not all of it, but she gave up the more flamboyant activism, like lying down in front of garbage trucks and stuff like that <laughs> when she had kids, um, mm -hmm. because she really felt that it was important for her to be there. And having interviewed all these other activists who were not there for their kids, their kids definitely suffered. Uh, so anytime movement 
completely takes over the home, where the affairs of people outside of the home are more important to both parents than what's happening inside the home, disaster will follow. And she knew that instinctively. So I got from her a sense that no matter how passionate I am about my work, for example, I cannot make my son secondary to my career. Um, is kind of, I mean, you have to find a way. Balance isn't the wrong word because there's no such thing. But you have to find a way to do everything, right? If you're, if I, so if you're going to be writing books, or in my case, learning how to write screenplays and all that stuff, I was going to have to do that while parenting, not instead of parenting, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's that expectation. Um, she was the disciplinarian. She had a deep voice. My dad was more kind of a writing on his legal pad in the corner kind of guy, not wanting to get involved in disputes in the house kind of guy. And I thought I was gonna be that strong disciplinarian, but it turns out that I'm more like my dad's personality. I would rather be the one in the corner writing in the notebook. And my husband, who was more of a buddy with his daughter, my stepdaughter is now uh, 35. And so I saw her from age 11 on. And then we had Jason when she was 18. So I got to see the, the teenage years first and then start from the beginning. And he had been more of a buddy parent with like, she was allowed to use colorful language around him. And man, having grown up in such a conservative, uh, socially conservative house, that was hard for me to get used to, you know, like hearing the, the colorful language, but she turned out great. So my first lesson was something can be different than what you did or what you experienced and still turn out great. That, that was a valuable lesson. And I, and I brought that lesson with me into Jason's infancy because his childhood was going to look very different than, than the, my sisters and I. He um, has ADHD um, and there, there are different issues that we're dealing with than the ones my parents were dealing with. And I've had to sort of reinvent what that looks like and I'm not gonna be the disciplinarian. Uh, you know, He just responded differently to my husband's deeper voice. I think there's some biology in there, I don't know. But uh, my husband had to sort of take on the role of disciplinarian and my son has to call him sir if he gets in trouble, which believe me, there was none of that happening <laughs> with, with my stepdaughter. So I, I, I think to me, uh, the most important lesson I took from my mom that I've tried to apply to Jason is to be there. I mean, in my case, I work from home, so it's literally be there. But quick example, uh, Steve and I are, are having a lot more interest in our screenwriting than ever before. Like we're working on TV pilots, we're working on a movie script. This is like the dream come true for people who've kind of been slogging their way on the periphery for all these years. It would be really easy for me to just lean into that. Um, but with Jason doing virtual schooling still, I don't do any meetings unless I can, I absolutely can't help it before 1230 in the afternoon on school days, because that's when he's in class and I need to be on hand. Uh, it's a more of a hands-on thing than, than my mom needed to be with, with me and my sisters. Um, and, and those kinds of things, like he's first, like Jason is first in the day, everything else squeezes after that. And any success that inverts that is not true success in my mind. That's just so us. how do you like, actually have to leave the house and have to work and have to have meetings. But for <laughs> us, that's just what works for us. Yeah, Sorry. totally. No, how do you actually get the writing done? So let's talk logistics. Do you like stay up until 2 a.m.? When does Heck the writing no. happen? <laughs> Heck no, I don't stay up till 2 a.m. Listen, I, I lost my ability to pull all nighters when I was in graduate school. So that was back when I was 21. And when I first got married, I used to push writing till the end of the day and my husband would be in bed by 11 and I'd stay up till one. I can't do that anymore. I, I, I don't have the energy. I need seven, eight hours sleep a night. And I really feel like robbing myself of sleep is stealing weeks of time at the end of my life. <laughs> so I don't do it. We, we go to bed early ish. We get up early, you know? Um, so there are a couple of ways to, to thrive. Uh, my husband and I teach uh, a program called Life Writing, actually, uh, which I can shamelessly plug later. And part of the premise of life writing, it's something he's taught, but it's something we also practice, is that you can write a, a book a year in a sentence a day. And people say, well, that's not possible because then you'd only have a 365 sentence book. But the point is, if you're a writer, and a lot of writers listening understand this, if you can make yourself actually engage with your project, for two minutes every day. I mean, you may just write one sentence Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 
But by Thursday, you're going to write two sentences or a paragraph or a page. And that's the whole point is that we lie to ourselves about not having time uh, because it's so easy to be afraid as a writer, afraid of success, afraid of failure, afraid of rejection. So we tell ourselves we don't have time to write when we know we just binge Bridgerton. We know we're watching Mayor of Easttown, okay? So how is that not having time? When I was single and I wanted to write a book in a hurry, I mean, I, I narrowed my life down to get up, go to work, and then it was all writing, like in the early before work, after work. I didn't have to talk to anybody. I got it done in nine months. I can't do that now. I can't just lock myself in a room. Um, my dad used to lock himself in a room to write, and that had a negative impact on me. So I feel like I don't want to do that to my son. And it's bad enough, the poor kid is being raised by two writers, you know, you're staring into space. He asked you to bring him something and like, you forgot to do it because you're writing, you know, but he's already dealing mm -hmm. with that part. But it's learning how to write in the margins and being honest about the fact that we do have time to write. Um, I used to work with a reporter named Ana Vesiana Suarez who worked for the Miami Herald when I was a reporter for 10 years. And her husband passed away unexpectedly at the age of 35 in the newsroom. He was also a reporter. And it was devastating. She had just had their fifth child. She has a baby and four other children. That's when she started writing her book. Okay? <laughs> so it's not about the time. It's about she would get up at five in the morning. She would let her sister do the babysitting. It was just finally she had the clarity of the mindset where she told herself, I'm going to do this. And when in, in my case and in many cases, when we tell ourselves, I am going to do this, we let go of excuses and we find a way. And trust me, I still watch plenty of TV. Plenty. Maybe because I can justify it now. It's part of my business. I, I'm a screenwriter, so mm -hmm. I have to watch everything. Uh, every streaming service, I have to have it. <laughs> so, it, but yet, I was writing early this morning, you know, uh, after I got made sure Jason was at his class. And, you know, I, I can steal 30 minutes here. I can steal 30 minutes there. Sometimes in the evening, like between five and seven, you might get that block. Just, you know, some writers do need 90 minutes so they feel like they can't do anything. I've learned how to just sort of dip in and out, you know, and it's because the embers never go cold. There's nothing harder than coming back to a cold manuscript you haven't looked at in two months. The first, you know, hour or two is just getting reacquainted with the manuscript, right? So, but if you're writing a sentence a day, or you're engaging with it daily, or even alternating projects I've had to do, you know, we're working on several projects. So I'm, I'll be working on one project um, the first half of the week and another project the second half of the week. Um, it's really a matter of the, I hate to use the word discipline. It sounds punitive, but it really is the difference between the inner child that fuels our imaginations that 10 year old inside of us who always wanted to make up stories and the adult who has to actually make it happen, which is by the way, one of the reasons I quit writing full-time. I was a full-time writer for 15 years and then I slowly started doing more teaching. And now I teach um, at, at UCLA. I've been teaching there for five years, just one class, but it, a nice income. Okay, it's like a nice baseline because as a as two writers, you can imagine our income was up and down and up and down. We can never predict from one year to the next how much money we would or wouldn't have. And I don't thrive with uncertainty. Like I I never spent two years after college just finding myself in writing. I needed a job because I needed to know I had security and I had a two bedroom apartment so I could give myself an office. And I made that proclamation to the world. This is my office. I hadn't published anything, hadn't even sold anything. This is my office and I'm a writer, you know? And I was telling myself that since I was four years old. So um, I even forgot what I was talking about. Oh, but having a job meant that I wasn't relying on my inner child to earn our money. I realized that's not fair. Wait, I'm the adult and I'm just lying around while my inner child is pumping out. I was trying to get on that book a year schedule this elusive yeah. book of year schedule. I was trying to get on the New York Times bestseller list, right? Um, I, I won't name who it is, but I know a writer, I feel like literally worked himself to death who had been one of my mentors. Mm -hmm. And I learned early on listening to his stories and man, he was so sweet and I admired him so much. I, I just feel like I don't want to name him. I don't want to tell his business, but he told me at one point that he spent 50% of his time on the road. And I was like, oh, well, that's not going to happen. Let me make a note of that. There was a time I wanted to be a stand-up comic. But again, 
don't want to spend life on the road. So that's mm -hmm. not going to happen. So I wrote that down. And the man had a heart attack while pitching to Hollywood. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it's almost a, a, like really a cautionary tale. Don't work yourself yeah. to death. Get your sleep, write a sentence a day mm -hmm. and stay focused, you know, um, but, but don't exclude everything. And you cannot exclude your family. You absolutely cannot exclude your children from your life to pursue your dream mm -hmm. to be a writer. Yeah, it all sounds very reasonable. <laughs> Yeah. You hear some people say like, oh, I just, you know, my house falls to ruin around me or my children are crying on the other side of the door. And it's like, oh, that doesn't sound great either. So this I have a picture. Good. Yeah. When our son was a baby, you know, those baby Bjorn things or whatever carriers thing. I have a picture of my son mm -hmm. with the baby strapped to him sitting at his desk. Oh. <laughs> and that's kind of how we rolled with it. We rolled and, and he came up with a brilliant technique. I don't know how many of your listeners are new parents. Mm -hmm. But sleeplessness is like my husband's uh, kryptonite, like not getting his sleep. So we knew those first four months when a baby doesn't sleep through the night, everyone talks about what hell it is. So we came up with a system. One person would sleep in the bedroom alone. The other person would sleep in a, a family room with the crib with the baby. Only one person is on call. Now, very often, traditionally, that person is the mom when people are breastfeeding. And, and, and it takes, you know, that extra amount of, I guess, faith to say, okay, I'm going to pump and leave it in the fridge and you can do it. Because sometimes moms, we feel like we're the only ones who can do it right. Uh, and sometimes we do do it in an extra special way. But that doesn't mean that another way wouldn't also work. So I think we have to give ourselves permission to share the responsibilities, like even with my son's homework, my son who's 17 now had trouble working with my husband, they would like clash. So I was doing all the subjects Well, I'm not good at math. So this past year, we hit a wall. I couldn't help him with the math. It was gonna have to be Steve and, and he was happy to do it. So that, I didn't even realize how much of an extra load I was carrying because I had this idea in it, my head and our heads, I have to be the one. No, you don't have to be the one. You can share, <laughs> unless you're a single mom, which is so hard. Um, oh yeah. That, you know, being a writer, but that was Anna, you know, her husband, remember that story, her husband had passed away. So she was not only a single mom, but she was a new widow dealing with grief. And I have no doubt that her grief helped fuel her clarity. And I think that's something that a lot of us sort of need to embrace as we're like coming out of 2020, a lot of people feeling shell-shocked. Steve and I were getting all these opportunities, so we were very productive in 2020. There were some writers who just felt like they couldn't create in mm -hmm. 2020. And it's okay to be whatever kind of writer you are, right? Um, but now that things are getting a little better, supposedly half of adults are vaccinated in the US, we're starting to go out more, we're seeing people's faces. Try to take some of that anxiety and bring it to life in your in, in creative projects. Like put it, I always say, put it in your writing, put it in a story. Yes, which, okay, so this is a great transition to your work because you've already mentioned a number of stories where you've done just that. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit, uh, let's see where to start. I'm particularly interested in horror and why mm -hmm. horror, because I am a fan of horror and your work in that you know, genre. So Thank what you. is it about that, about horror that appeals to you? Well, I've told everyone about my mother and the trauma mm -hmm. she suffered. It, it might not be surprising then to learn that my mother was the first horror fan I knew. My mother was the one who made me a horror fan. She loved it. Like from the time I was a kid, she had us watching these creature features of the old universal black and white horror movies, the mummy, the fly, all that. She gave me my first Stephen King novel when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And I used to think she just thought horror was fun, like I did as a kid. You're like on a roller coaster going, wee. But as the New York Times pointed out last year in a story, people who love horror did better emotionally under the pandemic than people who didn't. I'm, you know, I may be paraphrasing the study, but the fact is, I think uh, that speaks to a lot of things. It speaks to how horror lets us process trauma, both past and current. So in my mom's case, I mean, although she was a bit of a pessimist, I mean, Trump would not have surprised her in the slightest. She always felt like the gains from the 60s were being rolled back before her eyes in ways that I thought were not, were like, oh, mom, you're being paranoid. And now I'm like, oh. I was being naive. <laughs> so she had horror from past trauma and from current trauma. She was afraid for us to have boys. She was afraid to have grandsons for all the reasons I've described. 
Um, and horror really helped her with that. I never got to talk about this with her because I made this realization, honestly, it was really only after her death, which was my big trauma, that I started to see that relationship more clearly. Um, it can even be an escape because there's the worst horror movie doesn't feel as bad as losing somebody you love. Let's face it. You know, I mean, the worst horror movie, you can turn it off and it's done and you'll, you know, maybe forget about it. Um, so horror, I think is a really, really good tool. Not for everybody. Some people need to avoid horror. Some people need to go to comedy. I do both. I listen to stand up every day. I watch horror every day when I can. I, I, it's like the one-two punch. They're really two sides of the same coin. Um, Jordan Peele believes that, and it's evidenced by his career. It should Maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise that he came out with Get Out because he's so funny. Does that even make sense? It does. It totally yeah. does in a weird way. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, I, I lo I've loved it from the time I can remember. And uh, I did, it took me a while to get to it, though because of genre bias. Uh, by the time I got out of grad school, I had been trained out of writing horror and I had been trained out of writing black people. So I was just, you know, losing myself entirely in the canon, right, so-called. But nowadays, a lot of MFA programs are much more open, thank goodness, to genre writing. People are not made to feel diminished because they want to write horror or science fiction or fantasy because you can point to award-winning writers, not, not just the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the genre awards who, who, in fact, there are a lot of literary writers who are embracing it, even though they're still distancing themselves from genre, which really irritates me to sort of take on the trappings of genre while at the same time distancing yourself from it. Not a good one. Yeah, no, that, that annoys <laughs> me too. <laughs> I'm with you. I, mean, I will admit that horror, horror, uh, Harlan Ellison advised me not to call myself a horror writer because he felt that being labeled a science fiction writer had hurt his, uh, his career and his level of respect. So that bias is real. Okay, I'm not gonna blame the artist for the bias they're walking into, but at the same time, if you're, if you're doing a thing, um, it, it's, it's a little insulting to people uh -huh. who specialize in that thing for you to distance yourself from it, as if you're not doing the exact same thing, but with slightly different language. Just yeah. something to think about. <laughs> I totally agree. No, I remember in college, I wanted to write in um, a thesis about Ray Bradbury. And I went to my my advisor, who was a Jane Austen scholar, and he said, you can't write about Ray Bradbury. You, science fiction is not literature. I remember yeah. that sentence. And I was complete. That's the first time I'd heard that. And I was like, what are you talking about? What is this? And ever since then, you know, I've become I became attuned to it, and it it is it's insulting. I, agree. I had to find my way back to it. I had to, yeah. and it took again a trauma. It was um, mm -hmm. really I was just doing these like sort of epiphany short stories, white characters, <laughs> typing away uh, when Hurricane Andrew hit in 1992, mm -hmm. and literally turned my life upside down. I mean, luckily no one I knew was killed, but there was. I mean, it's hard to even explain. It was a windstorm more than flooding, and it was like trees, buildings flattened. I mean, you could look just for almost like a mile down, miles down the road and just see everything flattened. And that was my old neighborhood where my mom lived and my grandmother's house damaged my aunt screaming in a, her upstairs closet for two hours, you know. So there was, it was horrible. And also, you know, uh, I was single then. I'd had uh, uh, someone I had a crush on from college and we had been, you know, sort of checking it out. And he gave me the I love you, but I'm not in love with you speech, which nobody wants to hear. Mm -hmm. So with all that, that's a death when, when a relationship or a dream of a relationship dies as well. That's why it hurts so much. Grief is grief. Mm -hmm. Grief is an emotion and it can be applied to your to anything, <laughs> okay? So it's just the duration and depth that's different. But that feeling of grief happens when we lose things. And I was just swimming in grief, felt like my world had been completely destroyed. And I came up with an idea for a novel called The Between about a man who has a near death experience and wakes up between alternate realities. And he was black. That was like, oh, okay, I'm going to write what I know. I'm going to write a black middle class character. Because again, it's not just the fault of canon that I had lost myself. The, the black literature I read tended to be Toni Morrison and Alice Walker. And it was this rural Southern tradition. I didn't no. Okay. I grew up in the suburbs and air conditioning and I had never seen myself in fiction. 
I had never seen a character who grew up like me in fiction. So I had to just, I had to realize that it was a legitimate way to be a black author to write about something other than a, a rural setting or frankly, an urban setting, which I also didn't know anything about, right? I was like, where's that, where's that suburban black literature section? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it was like, just write, you know, just write what you know. And the, and the between came out of it. And honestly, uh, it was the best thing I'd ever written. Um, I didn't know it yet. I, I, I made the mistake of only submitting it a couple places, like one agent that I didn't like it. And one, I don't even know what else. Oh, a contest. I wrote it for, the deadline I gave myself was for a contest. And ironically, mm -hmm. it was a screenwriting contest, but they accepted novels. I didn't really want to be a screenwriter then, but I said, okay, I'll accept this deadline. And when you ask me, how do you get it all done? Deadlines help a lot. Quotas mm -hmm. help a lot. So when I'm really serious, I have a quota. Like this script is due next Friday. How many pages do I have to write a day before it's done next Friday? So anyone who work, wants to work in television and film, you really have to know how to write on a schedule. It's often true with prose too, but more so with TV and film, the deadlines are quicker. Um, the stakes are very high. It's not just one person mad at you. If you're, or, you know, uh, a few people mad at you, it's like a whole village mad at you because it <laughs> takes a village to produce a television episode or make a movie. Um, but yeah, horror, that's how I came into horror. And I was really briefly, I'll say I was very lucky that I started publishing in the 90s, because if I had come in the 70s or 80s, I probably would have had a struggle in my hands. But because I came in the 90s, um, in the wake of Terry McMillan, who wrote Waiting to Exhale, which you're like, well, that's not horror. Yeah, but it's black. And <laughs> publishers were like, oh, black people buy books because the black people were buying a bunch of books. So a lot of us who were, it didn't even matter what, they would like buy it to see if it would stick, like throw it against the wall and see if it'll stick. Um, and, and it might have been a tougher time for me if I had tried to come in through horror circles, but I never had the opportunity because my first agent was just sent it to an editor who had published a black relationships novel <laughs> and, and she bought it because it's like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, this is commercial. They were like, this could be commercial. That's all they cared about. Could it be commercial? And horror looked like something that could be commercial. So I was very lucky to start publishing when I did. And I'm lucky I'm still around to see the renaissance now where the film industry is finally starting to catch up. Yeah, I was about to ask you how things have changed since then for you, but also for, you know, for horror, for writing, for uh, literature about with Black protagonists, like how in all of these various um, areas that you work, how have you seen what changes have you seen since there's been a lot a lot of change and when it happens it seems to happen very rapidly but then really in reality i'm looking it's like been almost 30 years since i published my first novel <laughs> so i was lucky to be published in the in the 90s but what none of us knew and that was true also um in the film side they were eve's bayou uh by casey lemons mm -hmm. uh which yeah. is uh, i'll call that magical realism uh uh Tales from the Hood by Rusty Cundiff, which is a black horror movie. Oh, there were all uh, there were a lot of people getting opportunities in the 90s, but I only started publishing in 95. And what I didn't realize was that already the tide was receding. So by 10 years after that, you weren't going to have as many writers getting contracts. All of a sudden, writers were having trouble then getting contracts. Um, owing money on advances that were oversized that they'd been given and all this kind of thing. So it, it looked like we were had arrived and then it dried up. It dry, there are a lot of directors who didn't get follow-ups from their movies and a lot of writers who, who were not able to sustain. It wasn't a realistic level of uh, writing success given you know, that there's still a lot of prejudice and bigotry and unwillingness to try new things. Um, so really uh, something amazing happened. First in literature, uh, Octavia Butler started to rise in prominence in the 90s and continued. So even though a lot of the rest of us didn't have uh, the, the same recognition, she kept the fires <laughs> brewing long enough that by the time she passed away in 2006, you know, we were all kind of touring around together. There were enough of us. And even though her 
death in 2006 also set that back. It came back super strong with this idea of Afrofuturism, you know, mm -hmm. which is a term that's been around for a while, but people have really been talking about it in the last 10 years, I'd say. Um, and then on the cinema side, look, between Get Out and Black Panther, that's the one-two punch. Just completely knocked the doors open so that you could even have a common vocabulary in a meeting with a TV executive where, you know, if you, if you pitch something, they can think of something recent and successful, which was not <laughs> the case when we were making those rounds back in 2008. Trust me, there was nothing recent and successful that had been black horror I could point to and say, it'll be like that. Uh, but Get Out was just the sort of the, the the key to every door, you know, in terms of them, oh, it'll be uh, black horror, like Get Out, right? Yeah, like Get <laughs> And then Black Panther on the science fiction fantasy side, that, you know, again, hugely impactful. Yeah. And so what are the screenplays that you're working on now? Yeah, if, if you can tell us about them, where do they fall in that spectrum of genre? Um, and then tell us about the new book that you have coming out that you mentioned. Um, sure. So the generally speaking, I learned how to write screenplays because my books were getting option, but then they would stall in the script, the script stage, which I now know is typical and happens to almost every project. It's a miracle when anything gets made, period. But I thought, well, if I learn how to write screenplays, I can help move that along, which is such a naive thought on so many levels, because especially when I started learning screenwriting, and I learned from producers like Blair Underwood, uh, who optioned my novel, My Soul to Keep, and a producer named uh, Nia Hill. I can almost still hear her voice in my head talking about how the dialogue has to be choppier. It has to be more conversational. So literally my teachers were producers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got opportunities to write scripts. We sold a script to Fox Searchlight back in 2008. You know, adaptation was my way in. I didn't have any particular aspirations to write original screenplays because I already had the books and I could just adapt the books. But about three years ago, my husband and I realized that we were really sort of uh, holding ourselves back by only focusing on adaptation because that meant we had to wait for some producer to fall in love with the book and come to us and then fight to get the spot. And you don't always get it, by the way. And it was not getting that spot for uh, one of my projects that made me realize, you know what, we need to just write original scripts, like stories that our spec scripts that we just send out. And I'm telling you, it was a huge breakthrough. We wrote two scripts called The Keeper and one called Mississippi Shuffle. And neither of them has been produced yet. But, and I say, yeah, cause I feel like both of them will, but The Keeper is like an amazing script sample. We're getting meetings, like we have a meeting coming up with Shondaland. We've had meetings with Ryan Coogler's company. Like that script sample alone has gotten us so much and on top of that, I'm really sure it's probably going to get produced one day. And then on top of that, almost as if by creating my own agency, like all the other doors open, I do have several works uh, being adapted right now. I can't, I don't think any of them are public yet, aren't it? Uh, <laughs> well, The Good House is at Macro. I mean, they didn't say it isn't public, so I'll just say that. So we're, we're Macro is a, is a, is a great uh, company, and Effie Brown is the producer who, who, brought it to them with me. So we're pitching The Good House as a television series and um, adapting a short story of mine for an upcoming, as yet untitled, Black Horror Anthology series that Shudder is going to do. And Steve and I are, are writing uh, at least one of those scripts that is an adaptation of my short story, I think I'm allowed to say, called The Lake, um, which is in my short story collection, Ghost Summer. It's the first story in my ghost in my in Ghost Summer, and, and it's kind of ironic to me that after all these years and all these people trying to make movies out of my books, that it's a short story, that is my <laughs> first adaptation. And I really want to leave that to the writers out there who who may be lost in novels, and and I may be talking to you, if you've been working on your novel for years and years, as I did on mine for seven years. If you've been working on a novel that long. You might have some emotional aversion to the either the story or there's something about the process that's very difficult. And I would never say to give up on a novel, but also write short stories. Give yourself the satisfaction of a beginning, middle, and end. Give yourself the satisfaction of being published for the first time. I mean, some of the, one of the best writers I ever worked with, I read her novel and I was like, what, why aren't you published? Because she'd been working on this novel. So she wrote um, a short story based from the world of that novel. 
so she's not even cheating on it. It's still the same world, but it would be like a, <laughs> a, a it would be like an epilogue, you know, to the world of her novel. And she sold it to a highly regarded, uh, you know, anthology. Uh, so many writers lose years of their lives trying to learn how to write by writing novels. When novels are incredibly difficult to write, short stories are also incredibly difficult to write, but they generally don't take seven years. And even <laughs> an often published author like myself, and an author who is trying to get on that book a year system so much, spent seven years working on a novel. And if that was all I was working on, I would never know how, how talented I am at writing other things. <laughs> <laughs> like stories, scripts. So yeah, I worked on it. Sometimes I had to use that sentence a day method because the reformatory, because it's about a child's prison, because it involves the, the death of someone I was actually related to, even though I never knew about him. Uh, and I decided to make my protagonist 12 and my son was about 12 when I started writing it. Yeah, it was hard to write. The research made me cry. Okay. So it took a long time. I procrastinated. I put it off, but I finally got it finished. And uh, I can't say who's publishing it because it hasn't been announced, but I'm super excited about the publisher and it'll come out next year. And I also want to say without maybe too much of a spoiler that the whole point of my writing this novel was to change history. I am not writing a novel about a 12 year old kid getting beaten up and sexually abused. And, you know, that's the story. It, it's really about the frenemy ship, I call it, between my 12 year old protagonist and the, the ghost of a long dead child as they have to sort of come together to to liberate themselves and expose this warden and, and his homicides and, and his mm -hmm. uh, horrors at this place. So that's what the reformatory sounds, is about. Sounds incredible. Yeah, but this is a good transition back to writer motherhood, actually. Um, since, the, as you mentioned, the research was incredibly difficult to do, given the subject matter, obviously. Um, and with your son being around the same age as the children in the book. So can you talk a little bit about um, that intersection of motherhood and how difficult certain subjects can be to explore and the impulse to write and the the need to tell that story. Well, I've been fascinated by motherhood even before and inspired by it even before I, I had kids. I think because I, I had so much reverence for my own mother. And so The Living Blood was sort of my ask, a book I wrote, you know, back in the 90s was sort of asking the question, what would it be like to raise a child who's more powerful than you? like a child who literally has magical powers and <laughs> could cause a hurricane. How do you raise that child? So that, that I think the, the idea of motherhood, and I was in Big Brothers Big Sisters before I was a mother, so maybe that I've always had that, that in me, you know, that wanting to help nurture children. I noticed when Ghost Summer came out and I was collecting all my short stories, how many of them had child protagonists. I hadn't put them, because I put a child protagonist on the cover, and I was like, why? What's this? And then I realized, holy cow, all these stories are about children. Um, so I'm very fascinated by that coming of age moment, that moment when the child has to grow beyond the, the childishness of who they were because of some trauma they've been pushed into. But like the protagonist in the reformatory, you know, I, 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 if children say, oh, children are so resilient. Yeah, but still don't beat him. But, but they are resilient in a way. Um, and that superpower that my child has in the, rep the reformatory, and this is why children create movement all over the world, is because their idea of what should be is not fixed to what is, right? So if there's a sudden change, they can sometimes roll with it with much more grace. Like you can give an iPhone to a five-year-old and they'll figure it out in two seconds. If you give it to an 85-year-old, not so much because it doesn't look like anything else that they've seen before. But a child expects everything to look like something they've never seen before. So they're like, okay, they figure it out. And that's what I love about my character in the formatory. Like no matter what I throw at him, it's like, okay, oh, so now we're doing this. <laughs> oh, so now you're a ghost. Okay, okay, I see, now we're doing this. So um, so yeah, that and, and I think maybe Partially, I'm mothering through my writing, you know, mothering the child in the story, mothering the readers uh, past their traumas, you know, which is very similar to the journey that, that has made me write this in the first place, trying to mother past a trauma. So I'm mothering myself. But yeah, um, the reformatory has a missing mother and a 17 year old character who has to step into that role. 
And I think to a degree, that's kind of how we always feel as mothers, even if we've planned it, <laughs> even if it was our, you know, this is exactly what we said we were going to do, because it feels so much more immersive than we had the capacity to understand. It's like, okay, I'm taking on this unexpected challenge and you want so much to get it right. It just feels like the stakes for getting it wrong are like the stuff of deathbed regrets, you know? So that's kind of, at my age, I'm just trying not to rack up any deathbed, any more deathbed regrets. <laughs> I want to do it like the, as well as I know how to do it, you know, not phone it in. Um, and I really do think, well, if we can't have it all, you know, if there are things I don't do because I don't have time, I don't miss those things. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be uh, hustling and grinding. I want to, I want to be having fun. I don't, I don't work on anything I wouldn't do for free at this point. And I want to keep it that way if I can help it. That includes my teaching job, you know, don't tell them, but, but yeah. <laughs> That's the perfect place, I think, to draw us to a close. But since we have a few more minutes, um, I do want to ask, you've given some wonderful advice for listeners, um, but just a couple final words. If you could offer um, a message to the writer mothers who are listening, what would you say? Well, first of all, be patient with yourselves. Um, I think, you know, writers are either uh, aggressively not writing or aggressively beating themselves up for not writing, or maybe both really, you know, so if it's like, if you can't, like sometimes after a new job or a, a move or a pandemic, like I said, it's just not going to be there. Uh, that inner child is sort of in a ball like this and doesn't want to talk to you right now. And that's, that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes that's okay. During a period of stress, during a period of transition, when it's not okay is when it becomes the idea that you have of who you are as a writer. I am a writer who doesn't write because I don't have time that or because I'm too traumatized or whatever. At a certain point, you want to address the trauma, maybe through therapy, maybe through friends, maybe through the writing. So that's, you know, one of the things I teach in a horror workshop and I love about writing. Like, here's a quick prompt, you know, so you pick, pick a real life trauma that either happened to you or someone, you know, something that really stuck with you. Just, oof, that was terrible. Create a premise from that trauma. It can be the thing itself, or it can be that same feeling that that trauma created, like through the funhouse mirror. Like you didn't really get lost in the woods, but it felt like what happened? You were lost in the woods. Find the character who's the best protagonist to interact with that experience. And then figure out what they're going to do about it. Figure out that's the story part is how is your character going to interact with your premise to create a change for themselves or for someone else over the course of that story? What can they experience that will give them a greater understanding of the world or, or an understanding that they don't understand the world or whatever it is. Sometimes horror has a downer ending. You know, it doesn't have to have a happy ending. But if you can bite off that little trauma and tame it through storytelling, it might help. It might help you not feel so paralyzed by any particular trauma open you up to work on other stuff or invite you to engage further with similar traumas. And you realize, Oh, I like writing horror. I like taking this horrible thing that happened and turning it into Cujo, the dog, who's a monster. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm going to try that tomorrow. And I challenge everyone who's listening now to try the prompt also. And um, let me know how it goes. Email me at writermothermonster at gmail.com. Tell me how, how it went. Um, but thank you so much. This has just been the most wonderful conversation. And we have a, a comment here from Danielle Borsico. Hi, Danielle. She says, what a rich and enlightening chat. I'm a new fan. So, <laughs> Well, great. If you're a new fan, check out my short story collection, probably Go Summer, just for a little taste. Mm -hmm. And I do, you know, I don't mind plugging it. I do have a, a an online writing course um, called Life Writing Premium at lifewritingpremium.com. Life writing is just L-I-F-E and writing. It's about both your work and basically you as a protagonist in your own story. You know, uh, as you work on yourselves, you work on your writing and it has a synergy and it's part of that sentence a day. So check that out. There's a video on the page that explains what it's about. Absolutely. I'm going to, so you'll probably see me at an right. upcoming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Stick around for a second after I can say goodbye, but um, it's sure. been such a pleasure.
great. Thank you. I had fun thank too. You. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us tonight. This has been such a fun conversation. Um, you can watch it again. You can listen to the audio podcast. You can read the transcript all on writermothermonster.com. And if you're so inclined, please also become a patron or patroness to help keep these conversations going. And we'll see you next week for another episode of Writer Mother Monster. Thank you.